Welcome to the third session on knowledge graphs. Our theme for today is what are some of the advanced knowledge graphs? And all the three speakers that we have today, they are pushing the state of the art of knowledge graphs. Our first speaker today is going to be Mike Tunk. Over to you, Mike. Thanks so much for having me here. So um, my name is Mike Tung. I'm the uh, CEO of DiffBot. And, um, you know, uh, Naren asked, you know, if I would say uh, a few words about what we're doing over at DiffBot and um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, so I know Naren actually um, from a startup he, you know, and Jayesh founded called Minhash. Uh, what was it, like six years ago? Um, that used DiffBot uh, and, and which that startup was acquired by Salesforce. And when he asked me if I would speak, um, you know, uh, I, you know, always will say yes to Stanford, you know, as uh, my al alma mater, that's where I did um, grad school. Um, DiffBot was one of the um, first companies, it was the first company in Stanford's uh, on-campus uh, startup accelerator called StartX. Um, for those of the, you that don't know, um, and uh, I remain, you know, one of the advisors and, and one of the technical judges of StartX. So um, let's see, if I go to the next slide. So what is DiffBot? Um, we are a VC-backed startup of 38 AI researchers, engineers, and KG enthusiasts. Um, this is where we're located. Um, we're on Zoom today, but if we were on campus, this would be uh, just eight minutes from the Stanford campus over and the Stanford Research Institute, SRI. Mike, are you not able to see the slides? Oh, you can't see the slides? Yeah. No. Okay, let's see. I need to take over the screen. So let me do that. All right, can you all see right now? Yes. Okay, let me um, just go back to what is DiffBot? So um, here's um, where we are physically located, which we hope to return back to after uh, this sort of uh, shelter is lifted. Um, so we're a VC-backed startup of about 38 AI researchers, engineers, and knowledge graph enthusiasts. Um, the mission of our company is to build the world's first comprehensive map of human knowledge. Um, and the way that we think uh, the only real feasible way of doing such a thing is to use fully automatic approaches. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we were the first startup in Stanford StartX Accelerator. Uh, we were backed by um, some, far, some smart folks. Um, and we've been commercially operating since 2012. We have over 400 customers, including um, a lot of the major tech companies here in the Bay Area um, that use our technology, as well as many startups, you know, like um, Naren's uh, case um, that have become successfully uh, acquired or gone off. Um, to be public, and we are profitable. So we are fully supported by customers, uh, which is uh, an odd thing to say, but uh, sort of not the norm here in Silicon Valley. We're not um, dependent on external investment or grants money or um, uh, donors. Um, and what I'm here to talk about um, Today's you know, topic is advanced knowledge graphs. So I'm here to talk about our knowledge graph, the DiffBot knowledge graph. Um, so our, the DiffBot knowledge graph is a culmination of really years of, of R&D that we've done here. So I'm not gonna be able to talk about every single thing, but I hope to at least uh, cover the main concepts and then point you guys to resources where you could read more. Um, but we, we launched this um, in 2018. So this is a production level quality service. Um, it's not um, you know, merely a research project. It's being used by these companies, as I mentioned. And it's an automatically synthesized knowledge graph based on actively crawling and extracting from the full public web. Um, it's currently um, just some rough stats, about 10 billion plus entities and about a trillion triples. And it's autonomously finding about 150 million entities per month. Uh, the most popular entity types at the top level in our knowledge graph are all the things that human beings care about. So other people, organization, places, products, events, articles, discussions, images. Um, there's about 20 or so top level types. And the way that we prioritize those uh, types is we think about what are the most um, generally useful kinds of entity types to have in a knowledge store that span 
different kinds of business use cases um, that you generally would be good to have. Um, and this is including the long tail. So it's not just uh, sort of human curated um, sort of head entities that are useful for um, you know, popular consumer searches. Um, the kinds of entities that you might want to build, build real applications on are, aren't you know, like these, these celebrity kinds of entities, but you know, day-to-day entities like your coworkers, your, your vendors, your suppliers. Um, those kind of things may not be in other knowledge graphs uh, that are catered more for uh, consumer search. Um, we're running out of two data center locations here in the Bay Area. Uh, we have about 2,000 CPU cores um, that are building this knowledge graph autonomously, and it takes currently about four days for a full KG build. And the way that you use a knowledge graph is via either an API, uh, this visual dashboard, or through um, these integrations with other business tools. And I hope to show a demo of that, um, you know, if I, if I get lucky. Uh, later on in this talk. So um, I really want to cover just sort of at a high level how the diffbot knowledge graph is built, what are sort of the component um, key machine learning uh, technologies and that we use in this KG building pipeline. Um, we have uh, 50 or 60 different machine learning problems that we study at diffbot, right, and that we track the performance of on a, on a daily basis. So I'm not going to be able to talk about all of the, the different machine learning problems that we study. But um, these are sort of like, I've tried to distill it into sort of the key, uh, sort of unique aspects of our knowledge graph um, uh, and key components. So, um, and, and those are page type classification. So using machine learning to classify uh, what type it is of a page that we encounter when we crawl the web, um, being able to do visual extraction. So we were one of uh, the first really to really treat um, information extraction as a computer vision uh, problem, right, in this sort of um, hybrid uh, feature space of the actual visual pixels and the DOM, you know, and the text. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, natural language understanding, so actually reading the page and understanding what are the facts encoded inside the text on the page. Uh, record linking, so being able to link uh, entities that are extracted from multiple pages, you know, there might be many pages about Tim Cook on the web, um, we, we want a single entity with facts fused from all of those pages, you know, with the um, with a calibrated probability of like what's the you know truth of those facts, and so um, we need to be able to have automated ways of linking those right at scale. So um, so I'm going to skip crawling, right? So that's crawling itself is could be its own topic. Uh, it's obviously non-trivial to crawl the whole web. Besides uh, Google and Bing, we're the only other US entity that does full web crawls. Uh, so my uh, VP of search, Matt Wells, is the former founder of a search engine. So he uh, could talk a lot about the crawling, but I'll sort of skip past that because that's something you know that other commercial search engines already do, it's well studied, and go to what we do when we encounter a page. So uh, how our crawl differs from other search engines is that we uh, do a rendered crawl of the page. What that means is that we actually render each URL we encounter inside a real virtual browser, and we sort of play the web like a video game. Um, we have access, we sort of instrumented, um, <clears throat> this is the Chromium uh, rendering engine, such that we can um, have access to every uh, pixel on the page. We know it's RGB alpha value. We know all of the uh, styles and fonts that are used on the page, what are the colors of, of, of the text. Uh, we know all of the positional information from the CSS layout engine. We know the state, the internal state of the, the V8, you know, uh, JavaScript machine. So um, we also have, you know, access to, you know, if a video is playing the frame buffer of every frame of that video. Um, so basically we can, we have all the information that a human being sees when they're looking at a web page, which in today's web is actually more of an interactive experience than a document based experience. Uh, and we have everything at the, at, that the machine knows and we serialize all the state out into, you know, a long string of, of numbers. And th this is the input basically to our machine learning algorithms. And the first thing that we do is we classify the page. Let me keep an eye on time. So I mentioned there's these uh, 20 or so page types. And in our study, about 98% of the surface of the web can be classified of these types. And we also classify the language of the page, right? So um, this might be a product page. It's in German. Here's like an event page. It's in English. 
here's an article page that's in French, you know, a video page that's in Italian. Um, and this, what we call page classification, has about a 97.9% uh, per, uh, precision cross file score across the whole web, uh, which is um, a little bit better than human level accuracy on this page classification uh, task. Uh, what we do after we've classified the type of the page is then we actually perform visual extraction. So um, what that means is okay, now that we know that this is a product page, for example, uh, we use all of that, those features in order to infer, you know, what's the product um, title? What's the brand of the product? What are the images of the product? Um, what's the price of the product? What are the different variations and all these various product specific facts, right? And um, a lot of uh, the signals behind this sort of uh, classification can done, be done purely based on vision alone, right? So even if this product page was, you know, like a German e-commerce site or a Chinese, uh, you know, shopping site, uh, you'd still be able to pick out what's the name of the product and what's the price, you know, even if it was in, in Chinese Yuan, you'd still be able to pick out which are the primary images of the products and differentiate those from the related products and, and logos and such forth and ads. Um, so there's a lot of um, sort of a convention and layout and human clues uh, that the machine learning is really learning. Um, so um, I'm going to show you a quick demo of that. So we're able to, uh, on the average of, of these different uh, entity specific facts, uh, it ranges from between uh, 92 on the low end to 97% precision in production. Um, so let me go ahead and switch to a quick demo. And I'm going to have to speed this up a little bit. But um, I want to show you the page classification and extraction, right? So here's a page on the web. This is what we would consider like a navigational or like a home page. You know, if you um, click through to one of these pages, here's uh, what we would call like an article page or a content page, right? So if you pass that page into our extraction API, um, what we do is we render that page out and we're computing these features and we're running that page classification and extraction. So uh, the type of this page is article, but here's the title of the page, the date, the author, the author's uh, URI, clean text of the article, clean HTML of the article. Here are the entities mentioned in the article, the WHO, Donald Trump, the United States. Um, in fact, the sentiment of the entity and what its uh, salience is to this piece of news, Mike Pompeo. Each of these entities has an entity identifier, right, of, of its node in the Diffbot Knowledge Graph. And um, this is the API that powers, uh, for example, Instapaper and um, the stories feature of Snapchat. They use this directly. Um, so to give you a bit of contrast, you know, if we were to pick a different page on the web like this, which is clearly not an article page, right? And I put that into our test drive, um, it'll do the same thing. So it'll classify it, you know, as type product and extract a set of product specific facts like the type, type um, the name of the product, if the offer price, you know, the height of the length, the packaging, the weight, uh, the image of the product. Um, these are the normalized specs and meters. And so you see um, what's really different about DiffBot is there's no rules required. You don't have to specify in some kind of logical CSS or, you know, X paths rules for every site on the web, right, which would be infeasible if we want to uh, reach our mission. Um, so that's how um, extraction works. Um, moving on to what we do after we've extracted the page and identified sort of what are these generally bounding boxes, right, inside uh, the page. Uh, we know, for example, this is the product price. Here's like a product description. Then we uh, want to actually analyze the language, right, on the page to get facts. Um, so um, this is where we do um, natural language understanding on the text in all of the languages that uh, appear on the web. So I have a quick demo here. So I, I took um, uh, Professor Jenna Saris bio from, you know, uh, our KG entity, and I just pasted that text here. And so you see what we're doing here is we're doing entity linking against our knowledge graph, right, which is a 10, uh, a, you know, a 10 billion entity knowledge graph, uh, not just, you know, like Wikidata or Freebase. Um, we're able to find these entities and their types, right? So you can see the, the colors represent the type of the entity. Um, and we're also um, 
and so we were able to find you know some of these smaller types right that might not have um, wikipedia pages um, we're also able to find the facts or the relationships between uh, the subject and object right which are um, sort of nouns right um, so this michael genesareth here is a professor which is an employee at stanford so you see the evidence for this fact is highlighted within the text right so there's these two statements is associate professor at stanford is the current director of a logic group at Stanford. So those would indicate you know, that he, he's a member of the university. Um, this he here too, you see it's using co-reference resolution because it's, uh, it's the same, this he is Michael Genesareth, right? Um, so you can see here is an employer member of tech knowledge, um, uh, member of codex. Um, you can also see certain interesting things here. Like, so he was um, a member of uh, AAAI with pretty high probability, 99%. And you see, but it says here the temporality of that fact is false. So um, the evidence for this here, you see Michael Jenneth, Professor Dennis Serres was program chairman for the 1983 AAAI conference, right? So this is the past tense. So the temporality of the fact is really important too, if you wanna be able to use this for business applications, you need to track that as part of your provenance as to when this was a true fact. So we know at least in 1983, uh, he was a member. It's not saying anything about whether he was a member today. So the way these facts are um, inferred from text is via a technique called open relation extraction. So we're actually able to uh, extract these facts in an open world uh, system and then uh, map these facts to ontology predicates inside our knowledge graph. Um, and so by doing this, we're able to actually uh, uncover new kinds of relations that appear on the web that we would not have thought about, right? Or that we don't have um, any domain expertise in. And so we're doing this across all the languages and mapping it into these triples. So this is one of the um, sort of really hard problems of, of AI and computer science, which is taking natural language and converting it into um, a completely structured set of statements with a certain probability across that language. Um, so that's how the NLP works, um, and and what we do is I'm not going to show demo, but we do a similar thing with the images too. So we try to also uh, gather facts from the images of the entities, right? Like this is a green, um, for example, hoodie, right? Um, and what we then do is we fuse. We need to be able to use machine learning to automatically link and then fuse these facts together, right? So I am a person entity, but I might have multiple presences on the web when we crawl it. And these are all referring to the same real world entity and we need to be able to cluster them together. So um, let me show you a, let's see, quick demo of that. So I'm going to uh, search our knowledge graph um, for, let's say, um, you see, so here I, I'm using what's called the diffbot query language. Um, so there's many entities called the CDC, of course, right? So um, Control Data Corporation, um, the Chinese CDC. Uh, I was the one we're thinking about is, is ranked first. Um, and if we look at this entity in the knowledge graph, um, we can sort of explain the record linking. So um, you can see here um, this CDC entity, right? Which this is a representation of it. Um, the JSON contains even more facts about it. Um, was created by us crawling the web and then performing that automated extraction as you saw earlier and then using machine learning to link these records together right so you can see um, cdc's you know in the local phone book it's also uh you know has um you know a entity on bloomberg you know like an sec filing um we're able to um autom compare this you know using a, a machine learned distance function and then cluster this at web scale. So um, what is sort of like a naively 10 billion squared problem, right, needs to be made tractable so that this can be actually built in four days. Um, so after we have this sort of cluster, then we uh, take all of those uh, assertions basically, right, um, that we extracted from those with the probabilities and fuse them together. And that's the result is this uh, sort of CDC entity, right? So you can see we have, um, the you know address and founding date. Um, it has it's a subsidiary of HHS. There's also it itself has many subsidiaries. 
Um, here are all the articles on the web about the CDC, et cetera. Um, I can also um, show you that uh, each of these facts, we maintain uh, where this fact came from on the public web so that you can audit it. And so you, there's transparency as to how the machine learning system produced it, right? So if I look for like, let's say the address, right, of the CDC, uh, 1600 Clifton Road, I can see, you know, we're fairly confident about this, 99% probability. And here are the explicit primary sources of this fact that we found on the web. So you could visit any of these pages, right? And you could see for yourself, right? Like how it's present on those pages for, to audit the system. So I won't do that right now, but you can see here, right? So I got it from looking at this listings page. Um, how are we doing on time? Okay, so uh, now, I want to, I'm going to, for the sake of my time, uh, I'm going to skip queer, uh, the demo of querying the knowledge graph. I, I did want to, you know, do some demos because, you know, I, I am representing industry here. So this is like a, a real system. Um, but I wanted to show um, an interesting use case of how you can use the knowledge graph from other applications. So um, commonly, you know, our customers um, may query our knowledge graph to get knowledge you know, about organizations, about articles. Um, you can do some cool things like, um, you know, you can monitor the web so for, let's say I want to find Nike shoes, right? I can say like, give me all the products that a brand uh, Nike is better, right? So we actually have um, Nike as a customer and you can see here's all like 50,000 of their SKUs. I can, um, uh, I can monitor if anyone's selling counterfeit Nikes, right, or selling below the MSRP, which is, would not be possible if you were just monitoring sort of like compliant marketplaces. Um, because of sort of the multilingualness of our NLP, you can say stuff like, okay, give me um, all articles about Donald Trump written by date, um, but you know, I, I just, I want the article, I want to see what um, they're saying about Donald Trump in China. Um, but, you know, I don't know how to say Donald Trump in Chinese. So, you know, I can still query it without any knowledge of that language and using the knowledge. So here's articles about Donald Trump, but I could say, um, or the language is ZH, let's say sort by date. Um, so here's all, you can see here, um, these are all articles um, that talk about Donald Trump, but um, the, the, the word Donald Trump doesn't appear anywhere in these, this article. So this is uh, showing you how um, sort of unlike Google, this is really not a, a search engine that you can search all of human knowledge in a single resource. It's not a separate knowledge graph per language, right? Which is what actually um, uh, most commercial search engines are. Um, so I want to, Beyond just searching the knowledge graph, which we could do for a while, I wanted to show you a really cool application of, of this sort of knowledge graph. So um, one big problem that people that work with data have, so data scientists, uh, business analysts, is actually acquiring and cleaning up messy data, right? So uh, we have all of these great tools for modeling data, right, like TensorFlow and PyTorch, and for visualizing data, right, like Tableau, um, Looker, and stuff. But there's very little technology we have for actually cleaning up data. So here uh, I prepared like a toy data set to show you guys. Um, this, you see there's many, I don't know if you can all see this, but there are many um, data problems present even in this toy sample of just 10 uh, instances. So you see these, um, these two entities here are probably referring to the same company. You know, there's slightly different naming, a different resolution of the address. Um, there's a kind of inconsistent casing, there's missing information. Um, in this location field, this is like a web location, not a physical location. Um, some is just a country, some is very detailed. Um, there's typos in this data, like Palomar Technologies, Inc., with a Y. Um, there's un not undecipherable data, like this, you know, a non-English uh, entity name here. So this is very typical of what you might dump out of, you know, like a vendor database. Um, and imagine if you have like 10,000 rows of this, right? Like how much time it would take for you to actually clean this up so you can do some analysis and insight. 
you know, uh, using this data. Um, what we can do is we can actually um, enhance this data directly from within this field. So let's say I want to get the ID, name, location, and I want to provide it just whatever I have here in this sheet, which is, um, in this case, the uh, name and I have the location. Um, so what this is doing, this is showing one of the integrations, is I can directly uh, have, use machine learning to link this data to our knowledge graph, right? So I might as well do that for all of these rows. Um, and you can see um, just very quickly here, we were able to totally clean up this data. So now you see these two entities are resolved to the same identifier, unique identifier, have consistent um, sort of uh, casing to it. Um, the incomplete information has been filled from the knowledge graph. We have the location of this company. Uh, we fixed the casing, um, uh, different inconsistencies here. We've, this is no longer in Japanese, it's actually in English. These, uh, this typo uh, sort of has been fixed. Um, and we also have additional information. So we know the industries, right, of these companies. You can see these are a lot of uh, computer and uh, looks like semiconductor companies, how many employees they have. So we've already gained a little bit of insight into uh, our customer base, right? And I could easily um, query the knowledge graph right, using DQL directly from here so look for organizations that are in the industry. Um, say, uh, Mike, uh, can you zoom in a little bit? A few of the participants cannot uh, read it. Okay. Yeah, let me zoom in. So it's it's not all that important to what I'm typing, but I'm just I'm entering a query in the default query language um, from a Google Sheet, and let me try to zoom in. And you can see here. I just pulled in some semiconductor companies, right? Let's say I want to the number of employees to be under 50, because it seems like most of my customers are in that firmographic. So you can see I've basically automated a bunch of um, data cleaning and then also market research, uh, gathering information, uh, just really within a matter of a couple keystrokes. You know, this might have taken me a good couple days of work together by, by Googling. Um, so uh, there's many other integrations like this where we want to make it easy to actually use the technology from within popular business tools. Um, okay, I'm going to, I don't have enough time to, to go through much. I'm just going to touch on a couple of the ongoing research that we're doing at DiffBot. Uh, one is we released um, this data set. This was published at an EMNLP paper in the fall um, of this task, automated knowledge base population from text. So our goal was basically to build a better TAC KBP by exhaustively annotating text so that you can actually measure uh, the, the precision and recall reliably. And we have shown um, that uh, this is a, a difficult task that has lots of headroom. So even the state of the art systems are not at human level, you know, unlike a lot of other, other NLP tasks. And so um, we um, are, you know, active, actively collaborating with a lot of other um, NLP research groups right now that are using KnowledgeNet. Uh, and we give these sort of academic uh, research groups free access to our knowledge graph um, to do research with. Uh, another reactive area of research is what we call mo multimodal fusion. So being able to, just like the human brain, use multiple senses, uh, the, the visual, textual, and structured data to fuse it into a prediction about uh, an attribute of this entity, right? So um, this is showing, you know, just using the text alone or just using the image alone is not as powerful as using the combination of the two to infer that this is a gray stool. Um, and we also released this uh, data set. This was um, work with um, PhD student of uh, Samir Singh, uh, Robert Logan, um, and KnowledgeNet was, uh, was uh, diff default researchers. Um, so I think that's all I, uh, the time I deserve. So I just wanted to say thanks. Uh, we didn't have enough time to dive into everything, but you can feel free to contact me with any questions about this presentation. Thanks a lot. That's awesome. Thank you, Mike. Fascinating.
You have a lot of questions waiting for you in the QA chat. Okay. Our next speaker Do is uh, Kogan. Uh, Kogan, over to you. Let me stop it. Sorry, uh, Zoom just moves everywhere. So I was looking for the unmute. Okay, can everybody hear me? Are we good? Am I actually yes. unmuted? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, cool. And now to share the screen. All right, we good here? Yes, we can see your screen. Great, 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 great. All right, so I'll get started. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Kogan Shimizu. I'm a PhD candidate at Kansas State University, where I'm a part of the Data Semantics Laboratory under the direction of uh, Dr. Pascal Hitzler. Uh, thanks for having me here today. It's great to, uh, to be in such an uh, interesting company. Um, I'll be talking about one of my labs and the lab's primary interests, that is the praxis of knowledge graphs. We seek to answer such questions as, how are they used? Um, what methods and tools are best for developing them for those use cases? What makes them easy to use and reuse? What sort of semantics are useful for Kogan, describing? Kogan, your uh, can you move your slides to the right? They're hiding the. Oh, uh, you can notes, see the, uh, the notes, screen yes. notes. Yes, that's fascinating. <laughs> Whoops. Well. Um. What is actually sharing then? Is it? It's okay right now, Kogan. Okay. Right okay. now, whatever you did, you, it fixed it. Okay, cool. Sorry about that. Um, so then let's see, where was I with uh, the last question then is, um, how can we set the stage for easier downstream automatic knowledge graph construction and population? Um, but honestly, we can kind of distill these to a, a, single, a single question here which is how can we develop a highly reusable knowledge graph? Um, in order to understand this question, we need to have a clear understanding of how to, uh, how the use cases drive uh, the use of the knowledge graph and what infrastructure is available and so on. Um, over the course of this talk, I'm going to relate this question to uh, the use of modular ontology engineering uh, and its role in a world of knowledge graphs. So uh, knowledge graphs are an incredibly potent tool uh, that have the potential to act as a new common resource um, among both people and organizations. Uh, for example, consider Wikipedia. Uh, I think it is fairly easy to remark on the significant impact that Wikipedia has had on the sheer magnitude of easily accessible knowledge available to the average person. It further interconnects this knowledge through uh, linked articles, right? Uh, providing an easy and intuitive way to uh, navigate and learn about unfamiliar or even familiar con uh, concepts. Uh, Wikipedia, however, is n intended for human consumption with its preponderance of natural language, um, its sibling, Wikidata, on the other hand, allows for much easier machine readability uh, and more clearly exposes that underlying graph structure uh, that affords, um, and this therefore affords applications that same um, access to the wealth of information that humans already enjoy through Wikipedia. On top of that, uh, knowledge graphs also enable interesting data visualizations and uh, discovery of new knowledge in a manner that is familiar to human associative memory. Um, but even with all of this excitement about knowledge graphs, there are still so many questions that need to be addressed about knowledge graphs. Uh, for example, and perhaps more importantly, how can I take uh, my data, my expert knowledge, and add it to your knowledge graph in a way that captures um, the context of my domain and most importantly, my experience. It is unfortunate that knowledge graphs are so frequently found to be exceptionally difficult to reuse. Uh, I myself have both observed and reported uh, 
He's difficulties in reusing knowledge graphs. This is generally for one of two reasons, and sometimes both, that the knowledge graph either lacks a schema or the knowledge graph is difficult to adapt to a new use case uh, in the same domain and sometime, or in different domains. Uh, as we go forward, I'll discuss both of these problems, uh, that is why they're problems in the first place and what ways we have to mitigate them. So first, I think, is why exactly is a schema important for a knowledge graph? Knowledge graph? Um, for you developers in the audience, we can consider the nightmare scenario of simply trying to reuse somebody else's uh, library or API with no documentation whatsoever. A schema allows us to understand the structure of the data in the knowledge graph. However, we must still go one step further and try and figure out exactly what is or what constitutes a good schema. So I'm going to start with a mu much simpler uh, knowledge graph than we've seen so far, but here we go. Here is a, a very, very, very basic knowledge graph um, pertaining to Kansas State University uh, that I pulled from the Google Knowledge Graph and Wikipedia. Uh, the topmost node here is the university itself with a node for the undergraduate enrollment on the left and our president, Richard Myers, on the right. Then I have his alma mater on the left and his birthday on the right. From that knowledge graph, uh, we can kind of already extract a little bit of what the schema might look like under the hood. Um, universities, colleges, or educational institutions uh, at large are organizations. Um, Richard Myers is a person. Uh, we can capture the undergraduate enrollment using a positive integer and a birth date is a uh, date, right? From this simplified view, uh, however, perhaps we can already see some pain points uh, due to its poor construction. Uh, for example, is there any way for us to determine exactly which year that 18,171 value belongs to? Um, with what we see so far, that is uh, not very clear. It doesn't seem reasonable to connect the year to the organization because then how would we know exactly which year uh, that number connects to? And it doesn't really make sense for the number to be connected to the year uh, because that's kind of semantically meaningless. Um, so what can we actually do to rectify this situation? The year is a form of temporal contextual information. Um, a good knowledge graph schema would then allow for the incorporation of such context. Uh, other forms of context may be things such as provenance, uh, or geospatial data, like where the event occurred, for example. Uh, see here on the right-hand side, uh, we can change the structure of the graph in order to uh, add this context back into the knowledge graph. Uh, we do this by adding a so-called blank node here in the center, which is a point in the graph that allows us to connect multiple pieces of related information to the same entity. Uh, in this case, those interrelated uh, interrelated um, pieces are the actual enrollment number on the left and the enrollment year, which was pulled for the 2017-2018 academic year. We can also do this for provenance um, information. Uh, for example, we could say that the Department of uh, Education reported it, but I really, for this example, just pulled it directly from Google and it was unsighted. So we just have Google. We can also model the president's uh, or any uh, official's tenure using this same sort of structure um, where we add the contextual information for when they started that uh, career. So on this slide, we have a much improved version of what the schema might uh, be like. And now we have a human readable label for those blank notes that we introduced earlier. So enrollment or enrollment information might be clearer. And then we have the role of the president, which is disconnected from the person. But aside from incorporating context, what are other desirable properties in a knowledge graph schema? We already have some 
idea, such as uh, low maintenance costs. Uh, that is, if the use case changes or if a new use case needs to be added uh, to the scenario, the cost of adapting the knowledge graph should be low in terms of effort, uh, expertise, and time. Another is that the schema should be accompanied by human readable documentation. Uh, not only something that outlines the scheme itself, like its terms and relations and labels and so on, but more about the design decisions. What, what, is, uh, what led the structure of the graph or the schema to have these, these properties um, or the structures? And then how should they be used? What was the, the intended semantics behind those decisions? And finally, the schema should be rigorously defined in order to reduce the ambiguity of uh, the schema and therefore the knowledge graph, right? Uh, this will help reduce the variance of the empirical semantics with respect to the intended semantics. Uh, and then here on the right, I just pulled this uh, graphic from Wikipedia. We have the fair data principles. We also want the knowledge graph schema to adhere to those. Um, so we have findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, for the schema itself, those last two are particularly important. Um, however, the methods by which we achieve these properties are not just joint. So first, we're going to discuss briefly how we can achieve the rigorous definitions that are both human and machine readable. Uh, for this, we see the role of formal logics uh, fulfilling this low. Uh, logics can be used to express our human conceptualization uh, of, an, of an idea in a computationally tractable and rigorous manner. This allows us to communicate our schema very precisely to other humans utilizing the knowledge graph or uh, other applications built on top of the knowledge graph. By doing so, we can also make use of um, an existing W3C standard, which is OWL, or the web ontology language, um, which we can use to encode the schema. At a very, very high level, OWL employs a specific flavor of logics called description logic. Um, statements made in description logic are called axioms, and sets of axioms are called ontologies. When we encode a module or ontology using OWL, we call this an axiomatization. Uh, I'm, of course, leaving out a lot of nuance here, and the, the definitions are not strictly precise, which I suppose goes against a little bit about my whole thing about precision here. But for, the, for this talk, it, it does suffice. Um, but also, by using OWL, we have the benefit of promoting these fair data practices. In particular, the I, the interoperability principle, uh, suggests that we use existing standards so that uh, tools, or in this case, knowledge graphs, can communicate with each other. Um, thus, uh, so far, we see that ontologies can be used as a schema for a knowledge graph insofar that they promote the interoperability and rigor requirements that we were talking about. But what about promoting those low maintenance and adaptability costs? Uh, we thus posit the use of so-called modular ontologies. So using a modularly structured schema allows for knowledge engineers or developers to rapidly adapt a new or adapt an existing knowledge graph to their own use cases or evolve an existing knowledge graph to, sorry, uh, an existing knowledge graph to evolve as user needs or the data reality change. We also posit that modular ontologies form a natural bridge between human conceptualization and data. For example, when I'm learning a new concept, I tend to find some analogous conceptual structure that I already understand. And then I go through the process of replacing terms and relations in that internalized uh, conceptual structure with the new, uh, new things that I'm trying to learn until I've truly understood that new object. Uh, in essence, we hope to leverage this human's ability to create analogies between pieces of knowledge in order to create a methodology for making methodologies that is intuitive and approachable. Um, we also use these modules to, um, or we also build these modules to be self-contained, uh, which means that if we have two modules that conceptualize the same concept, 
but in slightly different manners, we should be able to, with relatively low effort, replace one module for another. We can kind of cons conf consider this to be like you have a, a large puzzle and we're just simply replacing the puzzle pieces with puzzle pieces of exactly the same shape. So between their uh, inherent adaptability and their configurable nature, the modular ontology seems to be a pretty decent choice for um, using them as a schema for knowledge graphs if our goal is for them to be highly reusable. Uh, we call the process by which we construct these modular ontologies either modular ontology engineering or modeling. So modular ontology engineering is a methodology for developing highly reusable knowledge graphs, and we emphasize uh, close collaboration with domain experts and data owners in order to produce these graphical representations and then systematically axiomatize those. Briefly, these are some of our key attributes, and that is modular ontology modeling is use case driven, and we assume an empirical or data reality. This ultimately means that we assume that there is some underlying data that we know will be available uh, or will be captured that the knowledge graph will be captured or will capture. Uh, modular ontologies are also pattern-based. That is, we generally try to reuse as frequently as possible uh, so-called ontology design patterns during the engineering process. We use these patterns to create uh, modules. Uh, we use them as templates to create the modules, and then we hook together the modules uh, in that sort of puzzle piece manner in order to create a modular ontology. Before I can kind of talk a little bit more about modular ontology engineering, I do want to introduce three new concepts uh, or three further concepts, which are our graphical representations, which we call schema diagrams. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about ontology design patterns, which we use to create these templates and the systematic axiomatization process that we go through when we formalize our conceptualization. Okay, so one of the most useful tools that we directly employ and honestly are probably present in most modeling paradigms um, in some shape or form are the schema diagrams. So to us, they are an informal but intuitive graphical representation that depicts the relations um, in between classes uh, in an ontology. Uh, however, due to its uh, informality, it's ambiguous by nature. Uh, we do use a consistent visual syntax to mitigate this to some extent, though. Um, as we can see here in the diagram, uh, we have uh, blue dashed boxes and uh, yellow solid line boxes. They're, these both represent classes, uh, but the blue boxes we use to indicate that there's further hidden complexity that's not really apparent in the diagram. So the agent, um, the agent here, the temporal extent here might be pointing to other ontologies, other patterns, or even somewhere else in the same ontology that we don't want to visually represent immediately. Uh, in the same way, uh, or sorry, not in the same way, we have the dark arrows here, uh, which are properties and relations, and then open arrows, which aren't in the diagram, would be a subclass relation. While the uh, schema diagrams are very useful for us, they still leave that uh, ambiguity, even with the visual syntax so far. And in the next slide, we'll kind of talk about how we overcome this. So this is the systematic axiomatization process that we use, which is essentially go through each node edge node uh, construct inside of the schema diagram and try and understand what that edge can represent inside of the schema. Uh, here I've listed 17 common axioms that we tend to use uh, almost exclusively inside of our knowledge graphs that we uh, that we generate, which are the uh, listed here in description logic syntax. I know this is not very readable, nor is it really intuitive. It doesn't really matter exactly what these axioms are for this talk. It's just that we have a list and that we tend to follow it. Um, and then 
Finally, we have the ontology design patterns, uh, which we use, um, or sorry, which are these tiny self-contained ontologies that we use to solve domain invariant modeling problems um, using a sort of crowdsourced best practice situation. Uh, they draw their inspiration from software engineering design patterns like factories or model view controller. Uh, but in this case, we're abstracting them to the notion of do they solve a conceptualization problem. Uh, so I already talked a little bit about this uh, schema diagram here where the agent and temporal extent might be pointing to different places. Uh, but the purpose of this thing is to have be this tiny self-contained ontology that has all of the axioms and the schema diagram for that temporal context that was missing from the president role in our initial knowledge graph. So what we do here is we create the president role and then we assign it that temporal extent information, which was unbounded because he's still the president of Kansas State University. So finally, here we have the methodology in and of itself. Um, it's eight steps long, and I could probably do an entire 20 minute talk on each one of these steps. Uh, so I'm going to try my best to just kind of do a brief overview for this. Uh, as I said before, the entire methodology really drives that collaboration with data owners and uh, domain experts. But the first three steps are very critical uh, for this um, because we want to identify the use case and we want to scope the use case to uh, a reasonable place. And then on top of that, we want to scope the the schema to be reasonable in detail because we can't model everything, right? Uh, then we want to generate competency questions, which kind of inform us how we expect the users to interact with our, the knowledge graph that we're developing. And then from the use case and from the data and from the competency questions, we want to extract these key notions, uh, which are these ideas that are central to the domain that we're modeling. The next two uh, steps are driven by the uh, graphical representations, which are that we need to identify the patterns, we need to construct the schema diagrams, and then we need to create the modules for them. Uh, and then finally, we systematically add the axioms for those models uh, using those 17 axioms for each node edge node construct, right? And then finally, we have to actually create the OWL files, which is a very simple statement for an innocuously, uh, disingenuously simple uh, thing, because we need to create the OWL file in a way that there are no mistakes, and we need to make sure that there's that human readable documentation again. So part of what I've done over the last uh, few years is try and come up with tooling infrastructure that allows us to do this modeling methodology in a way that's really, really approachable. Uh, so for example, here we have the Comprehensive Modular Ontology IDE, which is a plugin for Protege. And what we have here is it enables this graphical modeling paradigm. So we have a palette here to the left of the circle one. We can drag and drop uh, classes or relations and then connect them in this sort of schema diagrammatic way. And then we can choose what those arrows mean from that list of 17 axioms. In addition to this, we can also drag and drop entire patterns from the pattern library, which is under the circle with the two. And then three allows us to kind of change which semantics that we're using. So if we're not interested in a full-blown OWL ontology, then we can simply use RDFS um, domain and range to kind of create that RDF graph. All right. And now we have um, some other infrastructure that I've built because uh, I am running out of time here. We have the Opla annotator, which is a tool that allows us to describe the modular structure of an ontology. We have the Rawl tab, which allows us to create OWL axioms from existential rules. And then we also have Ontoseer and ODP Reco, which are two tools um, that allow the recommendation of vocabulary classes and axioms and ontology design patterns based on either the existing structure of the ontology or the descriptions and competency questions. 
Um, also for this slide, I've listed off some of our references, um, not references, some references to modular ontologies that we've already made before. Um, don't have too much time here, but all the references are in the rest of the, uh, on the next slides. And then finally, I have a short plugin, uh, which is uh, the workshop called Praxis, which is the semantic web in practice. We're looking for submissions that are reports on how academia and industry can build tools and teach knowledge graphs uh, to, to newcomers more effectively. So uh, take a look at the site here in the bottom right and submit anything that you think might be useful. And that's everything for me today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kogan, for an excellent presentation. So I'm going to start the next presentation from my screen. Hi, I will present Existential Rules, a family of knowledge representation languages to do reasoning on data. Let's start with a small knowledge graph. In this graph, nodes represent objects, like here, Bob, or classes, in green, like professor, and the edges are used to type objects, like Bob is of type professor, or to connect to objects like Bob is involved in number one. This graph says that Bob is a professor involved in number one, a public health study. Number one is about P. Bob is funded by C. C is a company. C produces something. This is a blank node, which denotes uh, an unknown object. This blank node is of type uh, pesticide and it contains P. Now to give a precise semantic to this graph, I will translate it into logic, into first order logic, which is the logic to talk about objects and relation between objects. There are several ways to do this, but a simple one is to see uh, classes as unary predicates, that is unary relations, to see uh, binary relations as binary predicates, such relations are also called properties, and to see known objects as constants and unknown objects as variable. And so doing, we obtain a set of facts. More precisely, each edge yields a fact. So, uh, an edge like Bob is of type professor gives the fact Bob is a professor, and uh, we have so we have uh, Bob is a professor. Number one is a public health study. C is a company. B B is a variable that stands for this blank node. B is a pesticide. Uh, Bob is involved and number one and so on. And the logical formula that correspond to uh, this set of facts is the uh, conjunction of all facts and the variables that may, that may appear in these facts are existentially quantified. So here we have there exists a B such that B is a pesticide, uh, C produces B and B contains P. Now we can, have, we can add some uh, basic knowledge, basic ontological knowledge to this graph like this one Public health study is a subclass of public interest study. Funded by is a sub-property of related to. This knowledge can be translated into logic as uh, two rules. A rule is, uh, generally speaking, a formula of the form if then. The if part is called the body of the rule, and the then part is the conclusion or the head of the rule. So here we have for all x, if x is a public health study, then it is a public interest study. And for all x, for all y, if x is funded by y, then x is related to y. And this allows to infer uh, 
uh, this uh, new facts, number one is a public interest study, and Bob is related to C. So now, assume we would like to uh, recognize a conflict of interest in this graph. That is, we would like to be able to answer a query like this one, find all x, y, and z, such that x has a conflict of interest for the study y because of its relationship with company z. Of course, we cannot find uh, an answer to this query in the graph we have for now. So the question is, what kind of knowledge should we uh, add to this graph to be able to answer such a query? There are uh, several ways of uh, defining of com a conflict of interest. We can consider several kinds of conflict of interest, but let's assume that uh, we would like uh, to define a conflict of interest in this way. We have a uh, X involved in Y. Y is a public interest study. Y is about you. X is related to Z. Z has interest in you and Z is a company. Now we can write two rules. The first rule is able to infer the as interest property because as you can see in the graph we have here there is no uh, as interest property. So it says that if X produces Y and Y contains Z, then X has interest in uh, Z. We can also have a graphical view of this rule with the body in black and uh, in orange uh, what will be uh, added by this rule. We have a second rule whose body is exactly the pattern that define a conflict of interest and this rule concludes on a conflict of interest between uh, X which involve X, Y and Z. Here we have a ternary predicate. First, we can see that we need to describe rather complex relationship between objects which will not be possible in uh, RDF or in uh, description logic. Furthermore, here we have a ternary predicate, uh, will, uh, which uh, in terms of graphs uh, correspond to a hyper edge because it connects three objects. So what can we do if we only have unary and binary predicates, that is graphs and not hypergraphs? A solution is to reify this ternary predicate and to turn it into a class. Then the rule R2 will create a new object of type, of type conflict of interest. So now R2 becomes this rule with the same body, but the head is there exists a O, so that O is of type conflict of interest, and O is related to uh, X, Y, and Z, which we indicate by uh, three uh, binary uh, predicates. So we will be able to infer uh, something like this. Actually, this way of doing, uh, uh, re reifying uh, NRE predicates is not only motivated by the restriction to unary and binary predicate. It has two main interests. First, we now have a flexible description of a conflict of interest. We can describe a, a conflict of interest with different properties, which will not be possible if we had only a, a predicate with a fixed arity. And second, we have now the ability to talk about conflict of interest because they are first class object. So we can qualify conflict of interest, we can add to them properties, or we can connect to conflict of interest. So let's summarize. What do we have for now? We have a graph that describes uh, factual information. It can also be seen as a set of logical facts. We have four rules. And this rule can be used to infer new facts. Actually, we are able to infer these facts. The first one is that uh, number one is a public health study. This is by the first rule. 
With the second rule, we have that Bob is related to C. And now with R1, we are able to produce the fact that C has interest in P. Why? Because uh, we have uh, C produces something which contains P, which allows to instantiate uh, X by C, Y by the unknown object, and uh, Z by P. With the second rule, we find now the conflict of interest, the, the pattern we were looking for, because we have Bob is involved in number one. Number one, sorry, is a public health study. Number one is about P. C. Bob is related to C. C has interest in P and C is a company. So we are now able to infer that there exists an object. Here we create a new variable O1 for this object, an object of type conflict of interest, which is related to Bob, number one, and C. To answer a query, the query we considered before, we will not only consider the facts that were initially present, but also the facts that were inferred by the rule. And now we can find an answer to our query. We will find that X is equal to Bob, Y is equal to number one, and Z is equal to C. The kind of rules we have used here uh, are uh, existential rules. More generally, an existential rule is a formula of this form, where the body and the head are any positive conjunction without functional symbol except the constants. And the specificity is that there may be a variable in the head of the rule that do not occur in the body. And these variables are existentially quantified. Here is another example of existential rules for all x, for all y. If x is sibling of y, then there exists a z, who is the parent of x and the parent of y. The key point here is really the ability to assert the existence of unknown entities. That is, uh, well, this is crucial to represent ontological knowledge with open domains. That is, we do not assume that the only existing objects are those uh, encoded in the facts. How does it work? More precisely, so as usual, a rule is applicable to a set of facts if there is a homomorphism from its body to the facts. A homomorphism is a substitution of the variable of the rule body by terms of the fact. The terms are uh, constants or variables in such a way that the body of the rule is mapped to the fact. So it corresponds to a subset of the facts. And then the application of the rule produces new atoms, new facts, from the head of the rule and the substitution. But in the head of the rule, there are variables that do not occur in the substitution, that are not in the domain of the substitution. These are the existential variables. So for each existential variable, we create a fresh variable, which is called a null. If we take uh, again the example of the sibling of rule, and assume we have a fact which says that A is sibling of B, we can apply the rule to the fact by this homomorphism, X is, is mapped to A and Y is mapped to B, and this allows to create two new facts where Z0 is the variable that corresponds to the existential variable Z. Where does this, this framework come from? Actually, it comes from two different uh, research lines. It, it emerged only uh, 10 years ago. The first research line is the line we, we pursued in our team. We long worked on uh, graph-based knowledge representation and reasoning, and existential rules are exactly the logical translation of our uh, graph rules. Independently, 
uh, Georgos Lop team uh, started from Datalog, the language of deductive databases, and wanted to use it to represent ontological knowledge. And to do this, to be able to reason in open domains, they wanted to add to Datalog this ability to create a new object. And this corresponded exactly to uh, allowing for existential variable in root heads. And this uh, uh, gave rise to the Datalog plus minus family, which is equivalent to existential rules. I have also to mention that actually existential rules correspond to old objects called tuple generating dependencies, which have long been studied in uh, database theory. So we can rely on some uh, uh, fundamental results that were obtained uh, on tuple generating dependencies. Now, if we consider uh, data access, uh, an important, uh, an interesting property is that existential rule generalize most of the languages that are used to uh, add ontological knowledge to data. They generalize uh, RDFS, of course, but also uh, lightweight description logics, such as, for instance, the tractable profiles of the ontological language OWL2. And they generalize these languages by uh, two features. First, by allowing for complex relationships between objects, and second, by uh, unbounded uh, predicate arity. Whereas description logics are limited to, uh, are, are only able to describe a tree like relationship between objects, and they are restricted to unary and binary predicates. So now I will uh, uh, focus on query answering, which is a fundamental problem because many high-level tasks actually uh, rely on it. The input of this problem is first a knowledge base composed of a set of facts and a set of existential rules and a query. And the question is to find all the answers to the query that are entailed by the knowledge base. That is, uh, we look for the answers not only in the initial facts, but also in the facts that can be inferred by the rules. I will consider more precisely conjunctive queries, which are the basic conjunctive, the basic queries in, uh, in databases. They correspond to a select from where a join condition in SQL or uh, to select where a basic graph pattern in a Sparkle and in Logic. They correspond to existentially quantified conjunction of atoms where the free variables are the answer variable. For instance, here we have, the, we have the, the query we have already seen. And in this query, the answer variable are x, y, and z because they are not quantified. And this query asks to find all x, y, and z such that there exists O, O is of type COI, etc. To talk about complexity and uh, decidability, I will consider query answering in the form of a decision problem. And I will take this one given a knowledge base and a conjunctive query Q. Does the knowledge base provide an answer to Q? Unfortunately, uh, this problem is undecidable for uh, general existential rules because existential rules are so expressive that they are able to model the behavior of a Turing machine. So there has been a lot of work these last 10 years to find uh, classes of rules, that is subclasses obtained by syntactic restriction that will ensure uh, the decidability of the query answering problem and even its tractability. And now many such classes are known. And the, the criteria that ensure decidability are related to the classical ways of processing rules, that is forward chaining and backward chaining. So I will uh, detail a bit about these two ways of processing rules. Forward chaining. Forward chaining is called the chase on existential rules and it consists of uh, iteratively applying rules until a fixed point. 
the result of the chase is also called the chase. And the property we have is that for any constructive query, the answer to this query on the knowledge base are exactly the answer to this query on the chase. And this answer can be found by looking for homomorphism from the query to the chase. Of course, this method is not always uh, applicable because the chase may be infinite. Here is a simple example. This rule says that uh, for all human, human x, there exists z with the parent of x and z is a human. So if, if we start from the fact uh, Bob is a human, we can apply the rule and we will create a new object, say z0. z0 is a human, so we can apply again the rule and so on. We will uh, run the chase forever. The other way of processing rules is backward chaining. In backward chaining, instead of applying rules to the fact, we will use a rule to rewrite the query. The idea is to incorporate uh, relevant ontological knowledge into the query. This is done in uh, two steps. First, the query is rewritten into a union of constructive query and more generally into what we call a first order query. This is a query that corresponds to a formula in first order logic and it is equivalent to the core of SQL. And then this written query is evaluated on the files. Importantly, query writing uses only the rules and it is independent from any set of facts. We have the property that for any facts, any set of facts, the answer to the query on the knowledge base composed of the facts and the rule are exactly the answer to the rewritten query on the set of facts. That is, again, we have uh, reduced the problem of answering a conjunctive query on a knowledge base to the problem of answering a query on a, a classical database, on a set of facts. Of course, this technique is not always applicable because for some queries, there might be no finite uh, 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 rewriting. Now, here is a map of a partial map of decidable classes of existential rules. Don't worry, I will not detail. I just want to show how uh, decidability is uh, obtained. For a first family of rules, we have a syntactic restriction that ensures that for any set of facts, the chase will terminate. For a second set of classes, we have that uh, for any conjunctive query, query writing is uh, finite. So for the first family, we can solve the query answering prob problem by the chase. And for the second family, we can sol solve the query answering problem by rewriting the query. The third family is a bit more tricky. With this family, the chase can be infinite, but the syntactic restriction ensures that the graph that is built by the chase has a tree-like structure. More precisely, it has a bounded tree width. That is, that is why this class, this, this family of uh, classes is called greedy bounded tree width. And uh, since uh, the, graphs that are, the graph that is built as a tree-like structure, there are some regularities, and these regularities can be exploited by algorithms to build a finite representation of the possibly infinite chains. Sorry. What about complexity? When we consider query answering, the relevant complexity measure is a data complexity. This is complexity defined with respect to the size of the data. That is for us with respect to the size of the facts. In other words, only the facts are uh, an input of the problem. And we can see here that 
uh, most uh, of our decidable classes have a polynomial data complexity, which is a desirable property, of course, if we want to be able to deal with a larger set of files. Now, I would like to mention a more general architecture called uh, ontology-based data access, or BDA in short, which was first introduced for a lightweight description logic. So here, we do not only have a knowledge base, but we also relate it to a data. We have two levels, the conceptual level and the data level. The conceptual level is the level of our application. At this level, we have a knowledge base, which is composed of an ontology, which describes the application domain with a high abstraction level. And we have facts that use the vocabulary of the ontology. And queries uh, use also the vocabulary of the ontology. How are facts obtained? They are obtained from the data via mappings. Mappings can be seen as uh, rules. Uh, with a body that is a database query and a head with, which allows to produce facts. One can see a, a, a mapping as a, a mean of uh, selecting uh, relevant data and transform it into a fax using the vocabulary of the ontology. At this data level, we may have uh, any uh, set of uh, databases. These databases can be completely independent from each other. They may exist completely independently from the application and they may be heterogeneous. It is with the mapping that we are able to select the uh, data we are interested in for our application. This framework for now has been uh, um, actually implemented in a restricted setting with a very uh, rather inexpressive ontological languages, lightweight description logics, and a restricted kind of mappings. We are now investigating uh, the extension of this framework by using existential rules. We use existential rules both as a language to describe the ontology and to describe the mappings. With respect to mappings, existential rules are very interesting because they allow to represent uh, very powerful mappings called global local as view mappings. These mappings are able to create a new object. And uh, this is interesting because uh, it may, for instance, palliate uh, missing values in data. And uh, this increases the uh, power of data integration. So to conclude, existential rules are uh, an expressive uh, family of languages able to express complex structure to create new objects. And this can be exploited for both expressing ontological knowledge and integrating data. Query answering is undecidable in general, but we have a wide range of uh, rule classes which offer uh, different trade-offs between uh, expressivity and uh, complexity of query answering. In this talk, I only outlined the, the core framework, but this framework has been extended in several ways by considering uh, other rules or extension of rules with stratified negation and disjunctive heads. I will not detail here. I just want to mention also that, that efficient systems are now available. We have some uh, very uh, recent systems which, has been, uh, which have been uh, specially designed for query answering with existential rules. This is the case of Vlog, uh, RDFox, Vadalog, or Graal, and many Tools are also usable, even if they were developed for other purposes, because they use they work on similar objects. For instance, there are tools in data exchange and data cleaning, which are based on the chase for tuple generating dependencies, which have exactly the same logical form as existential rules. There are also a lot of uh, tools in uh, logic programming, for instance, tools in uh, answer set programming, which, is, uh, which can be seen as a generalization of existential rules. 
Um, as I said, OBDA systems are still restricted to uh, lightweight uh, ontological languages, lightweight description logic, RDFS, or slight extension of RDFS, but extending them is uh, ongoing research. I will leave you with uh, some uh, references if you want to know more about uh, existential rules. Thank you for your time and attention. Thanks to the organizers. I'm really uh, sorry not to be able to be uh, with you uh, today and uh, I will not be able to answer your questions, but I hope you will have a lively uh, discussion. Bye. All right, so that's the end of our final presentation. We've got some good 20 minutes. We can uh, engage in discussion. So maybe uh, the first question could come from Kogan. He had been itching to ask something from Mike. Kogan, this is your chance. Oh, yes. Um, I was going to ask Mike, how do you guys, uh, when you're doing your scraping, a lot of news articles that people are interested in that might paste links are paywalled, like New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. How do you guys deal with that? So the way that we crawl the web, you know, it's very similar to Google. We just crawl the public web, right? So um, we can't, you know, uh, it depends on the kind of paywall you're referring to, right? So if we if we don't have like a journal access to, you know, like some, some PubMed, journal or anything like that, Diffbot's not going to be able to discover that content right in its public crawl of the web. Um, that said, uh, the way that we crawl the web using a real browser, like a real rendering engine, uh, is much more sophisticated than um, search engines that just crawl the HTML source code. Right, It's almost like interacting with the web. So it's able to use our machine learning algorithms to actually close like the pop-up banners and to paginate through like 10 articles of like a Buzz BuzzFeed article. right and um, and many of those sort of interactive things that um, other crawlers aren't able to do. Thank you. I have another question for Kogan, uh, sorry, for Mike. Uh, Kogan has argued for the need for modular ontology, ontologies as a tool to help improve these knowledge graphs. Do you need any of this stuff in, in DiffBart? Do you have any ontologies in DiffBart? Um, I think, um, so I think it's an active research area that we, I don't think there's actually a lot of good answers to this question in, in the literature, but as, as to how to use machine learning to synthesize a, um, a sort of a, a universal ontology, or at least what we call a, a default, like a consensus ontology of the web, right? So you could basically view almost every website on the web, like let's take a, a certain domain we have like products as having its own ontology, right? Its own way of, um, every store has a certain way they categorize, right? Um, whatever it is they're selling, right? And uh, we've been trying to study ways that we can actually, since we have a, basically a copy of the whole web and we have all the ontologies, we basically have all of the ways that those humans have organized their things. Can we uh, sort of automatically learn, right, from those um, other ontologies, at least the lower level, what we call the lower ontology that we have. So the, the, the upper ontology um, of the thought you know, we, we sort of prioritize and determine based on our mission, right, of trying to, to complete the world's knowledge. You know, pe people care about people, they care about products, they care about, you know, these very common types. But then it's the lower levels where it starts to get um, really where you have to lean on experts and you, you have to think of how can you uh, automatically build those, like, you know, from data and from um, Well, so, so, I mean, do you have simple facts like a person can have at most one mother, at most one father, or? Yeah, we, um, we don't have those facts like in encoded, but they're, they're just encoded statistically, right, um, in, the, in the data. Um, although pe um, you, could, you could think of like writing inference systems, obviously, right, you know, what a lot of the speakers are, are, are talking about that could try to uh, infer that that's, that's, you know, generally true in the real world, right? Um, Okay. Cool, so sorry. Yeah, please go ahead, Narin. So the speakers have uh, answered a lot of the questions. There's some 
questions here uh, for Kogan. Um, Kogan, what kind of tools would you use uh, to create custom uh, ontologies, say for a financial services company or a healthcare company? Uh, so the tools that we generally use um, are either protege uh, right out of the box, which it kind of requires that you have a really good understanding of description logic or, uh, or at least the Manchester syntax, right? Uh, and then uh, the commodity, which is the tool that I wrote for protege, which kind of hides all of the logic for from you, where it's essentially just domains and ranges and uh, sometimes you can do existential for it, uh, but it's all diagrammatic. It's all graphical modeling, uh, which is uh, built on some previous work from the lab. And then we're kind of driving it as part of my PhD research right now. Um, the other parts that we're kind of working on is uh, the patterns, right? Um, we have a, a sort of general pattern library that we use uh, and I have referenced in the slides. That's just these patterns for concepts that tend to pop up over multiple domains. Uh, but something that we're taking a look at through the, the OKN thing um, are spatially explicit patterns. And so I'm working with uh, the geoinformation science lab uh, with uh, uh, Christoph Janovich um, for uh, and, and, and Pascal Hitzler for creating patterns that can be reused across domains that incorporate spatio-temporal data or geo-information or geo-data in general. Uh, we foresee the same sort of pattern libraries to be developable for other domains as well. And we would love to kind of get in touch with other domain experts to kind of say, well, these are the things that are domain invari or invariant across our domain that pop up over and over again, but are general enough to be used by people in that sphere, um, if that makes sense. Thank you. So there were a couple of COVID related questions of which you guys answered, but sort of any ideas on, since we are in this unprecedented time, any ideas on how you can use DiffBot or Kogan, your tools to make sense of um, the situation currently? Maybe we can start with Mike. Mike, any ideas you have on how you would use DiffBot for uh, the current um, situation? Yeah, there's there's many different angles to that question. Um, so one is sort of like everyone you see, they're, they're all pouring over sort of like the same data points right now, which is kind of like the number of cases, the number of deaths, right, the number of hospitalizations. Um, and they're trying to build, all sorts of people are trying to build models for that to predict like how long it's gonna you know, take before we can all get back to, get back to work. Um, but the problem is a lot of those models, they don't have a lot of um, uh, predictive signal in them. You know, they, they are, they're sort of, they're sort of, um, you know, uh, they're sort of lagging indicators rather than leading indicators of what might happen, right? So one area I'm in interested in is that, um, are there signals that are in the diffbot knowledge graph, since we we're basically crawling the whole web, that would actually be leading predictors of how uh, different societies would respond, right, to like different um, policies, right? Like, um, you know, uh, social distancing, for example, right, or wearing masks, like, do, do you, do, um, do this guidance and people talking about those topics actually correlate to like more people like complying, you know, with those policies that might actually predict what might happen, right? Um, that's, that's like one sort of a angle, like sort of like the, viewing the, um, the internet as sort of like, uh, like a sensor of, of, of society. But then, you know, obviously another angle is like, how can knowledge graphs actually help the actual um, uh, researchers, right? Uh, I, I might, a lot of uh, my family members um, work in like pathology and like biomed. And, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of, there's a lot of information in these papers, right, about um, these, these drug candidates and vaccine, uh, possible candidates that they're considering, um, can, can knowledge graphs reveal uh, interactions between these different drugs, right, or proteins, um, or even situations with certain patients, right, um, kind of like personalized genomics. So that's all really interesting to me too. Um, Thanks. 
Kogan, anything you're doing with COVID right now in your research? I am not doing anything in particular. However, um, people that I'm working with are. So I mentioned Krzysztof Janowicz already, who is um, working on logistics, uh, how the, uh, the pandemic, how COVID has impacted um, the logistical structures behind, say, Amazon, or even with the, the masks and toilet paper and everything, they were able to very quickly uh, bring together a knowledge graph that indicated that we were going to have these shortages roughly two weeks before we actually got them or were impacted by the shortages. So uh, I cannot, I do not have any direct pointers because I don't know how public the research is because it's just kind of being like, okay, here it is. Now what do we do with it? Uh, but I would definitely say, take a look at uh, Christoph's work um, that's going right now for, for more pointers on COVID related stuff. That, that reminds me too. We had a, we had a DiffBot customer that contacted us um, last week and they, we always get surprised by how they're using the DiffBot knowledge graph. They're basically monitoring all of the stores online to see uh, whether the um, toilet paper and masks are in stock or out of stock to, 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 uh, to see um, how, how the, the supply chain is like handling it basically. So the product API, which I demoed, um, has the ability, one of the properties it can tell you is whether um, it's available or not available, that product and for, for so, buying. So I could write a query to DiffBot, uh, <laughs> which can tell me which store I should go to if I need toilet paper today. Yeah, and, and what's the cheapest price and where, where to get it. Um, we actually have a query like that to help us find cheap SSDs since we buy a lot of them. I see, interesting. A question for um, Kogan, is your protege extension public domain? Uh, as far as I know, yes, it is. Um, uh, it's released under the CC by 4.0. So my limited understanding of licenses is that's public domain, right? Um, uh, I realize I just checked the GitHub and the license is not in the master branch. So I'll have to get that moved over. Uh, but it's all open source, all on GitHub, and it's uh, you can find it through commodity.com. Cool. A uh, question for Mike uh, just appeared, sort of around adversarial nature of uh, attacks on the that could lead to erroneous uh, entries in the graph. You mentioned that a user can trigger the uh, a computation. How do you check if the user was right or wrong? In general, how do you detect malicious? and misleading edits? Um, so users don't have any ability to directly edit our knowledge graph, but what I was referring to is that they can, uh, I think a unique feature of our knowledge graph, which isn't really present in any of the other well-known knowledge graphs, is you can actually make an API call and force that knowledge graph to refetch all of the primary sources that it got that information from and re-extract, re-cluster, and refuse that data. So it has uh, the absolute up-to-date information from those pages. Uh, and that's, that's something that you can only do if you have a fully automated pipeline, right? Like any of the knowledge graphs that have like sort of a, some element of human curation or human in the loop uh, can't sort of like respond to that with an API call. Um, so that's what the recalculation does. It can kind of do like a re rebuilding of that entity on the fly. It takes, you know, a little bit longer than a, a query I was showing you, you know, takes, because it has to refetch it. So maybe 30 seconds to like a minute. Um, and the, the, the other question that's just around, what is the truth of a fact? Well, that's, that's what knowledge fusion is all about. It's, a, um, it's how do you estimate the probability that a fact is true uh, and that facts, um, you know, showing you each individual extractor, extractor has temporality, right? As something that, um, like I found a Michael Genesareth associated with AIIII, past tense, right? Um, but we also have the crawl timestamp, right, of when we discovered that fact. So that's another signal as to when uh, that fact was discovered on the web. Um, so uh, the, those kind of algorithms, and we, we love to see more work in this sort of like knowledge fusion domain, um, try to take all that into account to, to compute whether it's likely to be true. Um, there's other work that we've collaborated with other researchers on ontological reasoning, right? Like if it says on the web, somewhere that Mike Tung lives on the planet Venus, right? We know a priori that's very unlikely to, tr to be true and would assign little weight to it because 
We also know in the knowledge graph that Mike Tung works for Diffbot, right, which is based in Menlo Park in California on the planet Earth, thousands of miles away from planet Venus, right? So um, those are that's those are all the kinds of things. Uh, and then like the other malicious or like spam, uh, a lot of that goes into knowledge-based trust algorithms, assigning a, uh, a probability that um, an origin of, of information is likely to produce true facts, right? So uh, we can um, computationally compute, right? That Wikipedia is much more likely to be trustworthy than let's say some uh, Ukrainian blog that was created yesterday with, you know, um, a dubious DNS entry, right? So um, th th those are all different aspects of that problem. Of, of sort of like knowledge graph spam. Good, thanks. So then it looks like most of the questions have been answered. Well, so do you have any question for the panelists? We have time. Maybe Professor Janesrith has some questions for the panelists. I don't have I don't have questions, but I noticed that somebody asked about the relationship to schema.org. I just thought um, that might deserve an answer, unless it was already answered. Okay, Mike, do you guys use uh, schema.org? Um, we have, our algorithm has access visibility into the schema.org markup, right, as part of its, as a, of its search space, right? So the machine learning algorithm is trying to extract from a, a joint feature space, including um, the visual layout rendering of the page, as well as the text and the DOM. And of course, uh, semantic markup is in there. Um, there's um, the visual layout and fonts and colors and so forth. Um, so it can use that as a feature, but it doesn't rely on it because it's both incomplete on the web and it's often noisy and it's often uh, gamed, right? So people that want to rank high for SEO juice in Google will often put the wrong uh, semantic markup. Um, okay, cool. So there was also this question about uh, uh, how does... Uh, DiffBot store its data? What data structure or knowledge graph systems are you guys using? Yeah, um, well, the most surprising thing probably the, is that none of the graph databases we, we tested can really scale and are really designed for the workload of injecting like a, a billion entities, loading it from, from an empty state. Um, so, uh, you know, we tested like Neo4j and, and Titan and um, triple stores and things like that. Um, that was about a year and a half ago that we did a lot of benchmarking of those. It might have, the state of the art might have gotten better since then. Um, so what we ended up doing is um, we, we do have a hybrid system that has basically like a document store as well as like a key value store. Um, and then when you issue a DQL, default query language query, the query planner decides basically um, which backend systems to form a query and fetch it from and then compute an answer. Um, and we do some tricks, like for example, we denormalize the data from the graph about four edges out. So you can, you can write queries that join like, you know, four tables, right, or types, but you can't write queries that join like five types, right? But we found, you know, like 99% of business queries, you, you don't really need to have really long queries that join five types. Um, that's for the real-time system, which basically has like sub-second query response. Um, if you want to write queries in the different knowledge graph that are like page rank kind of algorithms, right, where you're computing like a power iteration, right, or like shortest path or um, proximity kinds of algorithms, then you'd have to do that offline. Okay. Um, so you guys rolled your own system to store your data? Is that the idea? Yeah, we sort of... Uh, sort of like duct tapes our own system together, um, but it's act actually like one of our current bottlenecks. Like we could easily scale up to a trillion entities if we can only solve this problem of, of how to scale the, the actual. Currently out of the four days it takes to build our knowledge graph, one of those days is entirely devoted just to indexing and loading the data so that it's searchable, right? Um, and so if we don't solve sort of that problem, we can't sort of scale it to the next level. Right. A question just came for Kogan. How does Comod IDE compare to Ontograph in Protege? Uh, so um, right off the bat, uh, commodity is uh, a two-way street. So Ontograph is purely visualization as far as I recall. 
uh, which means that you all you have to have the um, ontology already written, and then you go to ontograph, and it will generate a visualization for you. Uh, commodity kind of does both, where you can have an existing ontology and it will generate a visualization using our graphical syntax, or you could start with a diagram that you kind of manually assemble by dragging and dropping the uh, uh, patterns or the classes and relations and drawing the arrows between them and labeling them, and it will generate these axioms, these classes, these uh, of relations inside of Protege as well. So consider Commodity to be a two-way street between the power of Protege and the graphical paradigm. It's also true, I believe, that Autograph is only Protege 4, so is not and will not work in Protege 5. Cool, thanks. So maybe we have like a few minutes more. Yeah, so there is, if this question is interesting. Does that diff bot knowledge graph handle queries that take images as input? For example, you give it an image and ask, what year was this car made? Um, we have like a, a research prototype that, that does that. It basically um, computes a visual hash on an input and then finds uh, images in the KG and then those that are associated to products and that assuming that has that information about that product there could you know could answer that, but it's not um it's not a, a production quality. It's like a it's a research um, level of quality. So, uh, Mike, what is your vision for DiffPod? Where do you think you will be in a few years? Um, I mean, our goal is is that to have uh, a complete map of human knowledge. So, think about. Um, sort of every public fact about an entity, right? A known entity out there being encoded in machine readable format and queryable and usable by applications. Um, that's uh, where I think, um, I don't see, uh, at least from my viewpoint, well, like- I think, I think it's, I think what you mean to say is you want to have a complete map of human entities and, and organizations and, and things that people care about. Uh, saying that you want a complete map of human knowledge, I don't see how DiffPod will ever get there. Yeah, I think all knowledge graphs are by definition incomplete, right? Knowledge is incomplete. It depends on the use case, right? If your use case is to build a physically accurate simulation of the universe, you need the position of every atom and quark, right? Uh, in, or, in your knowledge graph in order to solve that use case, right? Um, but from our standpoint, it's about sort of like building the everything store of knowledge so that you, you uh, have a starting point for building useful applications, right? So we wanna have most of the entities that people care about, right? Like people, organizations, products, and things like that. Being able to satisfy like, you know, like 99% of useful business use cases, right? At production level quality and integrating and making it easy to use inside real applications. Right. So, so just a question there. Um, so you're talking about facts that you've gleaned from um, information that's published on the web, but there are facts that one can conclude from the information that's on the web. And I'm curious about that. I presume you're not gonna know whether P equals NP or not. I don't <laughs> know whether you'll know whether there are axioms of mathematics yeah. true or false until somebody has proved them. Uh, yes. you, you, you mentioned reasoning briefly earlier, but uh, you didn't say very much about that. So there's going to be other knowledge um, that might or may not exist yet, which is, hasn't been published on the web, and so it's not going to appear in your knowledge graph until somebody does publish it. Or do you imagine bringing reasoning tools into the picture at some point as well? Well, whether P equals NP is, is, is not known yet, right? So it's not knowledge, right? So I'd say that's a little bit out of scope. Um, but um, the way we view the web is really like the world's largest man-made sensor. And those are um, signals that we can use to build a, a, an accurate, uh, as complete as possible map of public information, right? We're not talking about private information, of course. Um, but then uh, many of the properties in the knowledge graph are uh, inferred as well from other direct properties. So, you know, uh, you saw when I was looking at, you know, my entity that we know that I'm a male, for example, right? It's not because it explicitly says like Mike Tung is a male in uh, on some page on the web, but it's uh, there's a lot of signals there. I right? like the pronoun co-reference, 
the actual picture of the person. Um, so um, we uh, we have uh, some research collaborations. You know, one of them was, for example, with uh, Lee Skitor at UC Santa Cruz, um, testing out techniques like you know probabilistic soft logic. Um, the challenge is trying to get those scale at, at production quality. Um, but we would very much like to have like a base, right? That you could run and compute new knowledge, uh, discover, of course, new patterns statistically, um, and, and find new discoveries and things like that. All right. So yeah, I mean, I think that's a that's a great point to end. We are also at the end of the time. Mike, did you want to say anything? Well, I just want to say he used the word statistically in there. So anything <laughs> that's provable is not in scope, as far as I understand it. That's all. Yeah. Oh, I forgot I was talking to a, a logician. Yeah, but uh, so sort of for us, for us, check your knowledge. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for us, truth is just sort of like a, is sort of a consensus, you know, like commonly uh, accepted uh, okay. truth values. So <laughs> with that, I'd really like to thank our speakers today, Mike and Kogan and uh, Marie Lohr, who presented in absentia. They I think gave fantastic presentations. They stimulated so many questions and they were diligent about answering all the questions that the audience put in the QA, QA dialogue. So thank you all very much and we will see you next week, same time.